So my name is Andrea Payne. Um, you'll see that I, I was not on the list of speakers today. So my, my primary role is to kind of introduce the overarching project that these speakers are all um, did their dissertations as a part of. So as um, as we've already uh, as I already mentioned, the project's name is CELAS, which which means significance of ice lost to Arctic landscapes. CELA is a Greenlandic word which relates the concept of weather in the environment. Um, so I'm kind of we're kind of paying tribute to the the main study location that uh, we are conducting research in here. So I'm going to start with a figure and a concept that that most people are already quite familiar with, and that is that the Greenland ice sheet is melting. Um, this figure kind of summarizes the state of science and global impacts of Greenland ice sheet melt over the last few decades. So you can see here that the x axis is years from 1990 to 2020. Uh, the black line here represents uh, the decline in the mass of the Greenland ice sheet over this time period. Um, and this is reflected in an increasing uh, meltwater anomaly um, from the Greenland ice sheet melting um, and delivery to the ocean. Um, going along with this, uh, the gold line is showing global mean sea level uh, relative to 1993, which has also been increasing over time. Um, so these are really large scale changes that are happening. And we can think about this in terms of um, the ice melt, which is an increase in the land to sea fluxes of water and terrestrial solutes that are carried in this glacial meltwater. Um, and this drives really important impacts to things like coastal metabolism, circulation and ecosystems. Uh, which has led to a lot of research being done on the Greenland ice sheet. So this gray, these gray bars here represent the number of publications per year related to the Greenland ice sheet, addressing these, these really important questions. Um, what we're going to talk about today is actually kind of the flip side of the coin of this story, um, where we can think about the loss of the Greenland ice sheet and its in increasing meltwater fluxes to the coast. Um, however, as this ice is melting, it's also exposing new landscapes that also contribute water and solutes to the coast, but likely differ in terms of the, the quantity and the composition of this water. So kind of the overarching question of the CELA project is looking at what modern deglaciating landscapes can tell us about terrestrial water and solute fluxes from land to sea over past and future climate shifts. So to do this, we look at different watersheds in Greenland. So this is a conceptual model showing um, that the Greenland ice sheet uh, was once to the extent of the coast here, and it's been retreating uh, over the past um, 12 to 15,000 years or so. Um, so to look at this question, we compare two types of watersheds. Uh, we look at glaciated watersheds, which directly drain ice, ice, uh, ice melt and drain to what we call glacial meltwater rivers. So the water that is being um, that is being discharged from th these glaciated watersheds is comprised from uh, things like ice melt and local precip precipitation. And the composition of this water reflects differing uh, water sources throughout the glacial system itself, including superglacial meltwater and subglacial meltwater. As this landscape has retreated, um, these new landscapes have been exposed and subject to new processes, including terrestrial ecosystem development and soil formation. Um, and these are watersheds that are disconnected from the ice sheet and drain water from things like precipitation, active layer melt, and permafrost. However, the composition of this water, um, the hypothesis was that it was significantly different because this, while all of this material uh, originated as glacial sediments, these watersheds have been exposed to, to differing landscape development processes. So by comparing these two types of watersheds um, in modern deglaciating Greenland, we can get a sense for how uh, riverine fluxes of water and solutes vary um, with ice retreat. So this project, the CELA project, um, started using some preliminary findings from a previous iteration of this project, um, looking at a transect from the coast to the Greenland ice sheet in southwest Greenland. So this is the transect here, and it's between the towns of Kangalooswak and Sisimut. Um, so these white dashed lines show the position of the ice sheet over the past 12.3 thousand years or so. So it's been retreating over this time, um, and it's left about a 200 kilometer swath of land that has been subject to the processes of landscape development um, and are drained by non-glacial water, uh, non-glacial watersheds. Um, so there's a few pr uh, primary locations we've been working at, along this transect. The first is the Glacial Watson River, um, which drains um, 
uh, which is one of the largest uh, glacial meltwater rivers in Greenland is also very uh, well studied because of its accessibility. Uh, we compare the glacial meltwater river to um, different non-glacial watersheds along this transect. So we have an inland non-glacial watershed and some coastal non-glacial watershed. Um, and these pictures here show just a kind of a visual comparison of what these watersheds look like. So our glacial meltwater river um, contains a lot of suspended sediment, um, very not so much vegetation along the, the reaches of the stream, whereas these non-glacial streams are vegetated and um, support uh, thriving ecosystems. So before the CELA project, um, one of the focuses of this research was to characterize uh, different fluxes between fluxes from, uh, from land to sea from these watersheds by looking at discharge and chemistry. Um, so this was between uh, 2017 and 2018, so we collected uh, discharge data and chemical data in order to calculate what these fluxes are. The CELA project builds on this work um, by looking at a process-based invest investigation of what controls the composition of this water. So really including uh, microbiology, hydrology, geochemistry, biogeochemistry, and ecohydrology to understand how this landscape has developed and how this impacts um, land to sea fluxes of water and solutes. So I'm just gonna discuss a few basic, uh, not basic, but a few take home um, findings from this pre sela work. Um, and that the first finding is that specific discharge or the amount of water flowing from these landscapes normalized to the watershed area is actually not all that different between our streams. Um, and this is some, somewhat surprising if you look at a hydrograph of discharge over time. So this is between 27 or over the melt season of 2017. Um, if we look at the, the discharge from the glacial meltwater river, you can see that we reach uh, volumes of about uh, 1,000 cubic meters per second. Um, and this is in comparison to these non-glacial streams, which are much smaller. So they drain um, at, at maximum rates of about 10 cubic meters per second. Um, so on a first glance, you might, uh, might think that these streams are play a pretty small role in terms of land to sea fluxes of material. However, if we normalize the stream fluxes to the watershed area, we come up with a specific discharge number and they're actually not all that terribly different between streams. So there's a large amount of uncertainty in the watershed area of this glacial river, which leads us to a range in specific discharge over this melt year, uh, which encompasses the specific discharge that we've calculated from the non-glacial streams. So one of the, um, the take-homes from this uh, observation was that if these stream systems have similar specific discharge, then the, the fluxes of solutes may depend more on the concentrations than on the volume of water for these particular streams. Um, and this is kind of a synthesis of some of the geochemical information that we collected pre sela um, comparing the fluxes of nutrients between the glacial watershed and our non-glacial watersheds. So on the left here, we have dissolved inorganic nitrogen, which we consider to be nitrate plus ammonium. Um, and these are uh, the concentrations of nutrients within the stream. So you can see that the glacial streams have generally higher concentrations of dissolved inorganic nitrogen, um, and they also have higher concentrations of phosphate. Um, both of these are really important nutrients and can drive things like in-stream metabolism, as well as be important for coastal ecosystems that utilize nutrients. Um, one of the interesting differences we found between these stream types was that not only was the discharge of nutrients significantly different, but the ratios of nutrients were significantly different between stream types. So this is showing the ratio of dissolved inorganic nitrogen to phosphate um, compared to the red field ratio, which is more or less the uptake ratio that phytoplankton will assimilate these nutrients in. Um, so you can see that the glacial stream is delivering nutrients um, more or less consistently with what would be expected um, for assimilation ratios. However, our non-glacial streams are exporting relatively higher amounts of nitrogen than phosphate, um, which could drive differences in in-stream processes as well as coastal biogeochemical processes. So some of the key questions that resulted from these uh, preliminary findings, um, and this kind of sets the stage for the talks you'll see today, um, was how does the superglacial environment, so this is the on top of the ice sheet, how does how did the superglacial environment impact downstream microbiology, carbon and nutrient cycling? 
Uh, one of the second questions is, how does the in-stream cycling of nutrients vary across landscapes with differing exposure ages? And then finally, if we think about these discharges to the, to the, um, to the ocean, to, to fjords, um, most of this is, is, as you can see here, the, the, the Watson River discharges to a, a, a fjord. Um, so how does coastal freshwater runoff actually affect fjord circulation dynamics? So you're going to see three talks today, which span the range of watersheds that I've uh, previously uh, outlined. So first you see Quincy talking about the superglacial environment, looking at microbiology and biogeochemistry. Um, then Yu Sung is going to talk about some of the in-stream metabolism in our, in our deglaciated watersheds, um, focusing on nutrient dynamics. And then finally, Fernando is going to talk about fjord hydrodynamics and physical oceanography. So with that, I will turn it to Quincy, if I can figure out how to do that. Great. Okay, so hi, I'm Quincy. I'm a PhD student on this project, um, and I'm focused on the microbiology that's going on on top of the ice sheet. So a lot of people have studied the um, superglacial environment pretty well. Um, people mostly study things like cryokinite holes, superglacial streams, um, algal blooms um, recently. And we know a lot about the geochemical cycling and the microbiology happening there, but I'm actually looking slightly beneath the ice. So in the upper about one meter of glaciers, there's this thing called the weathering crust aquifer. So during summer months, um, sunlight causes internal melt to occur and meltwater is stored in this area. So the ice is super porous. So you can kind of see here on the left. And of course, if you've ever walked along a glacier, it's nothing like you would kind of picture um, during the summer. It's really porous. There's a ton of water there. Um, so I'm kind of working from this idea that maybe there's some really interesting microbiology and geochemistry that's going on. So what we did over the past two summers is we drilled boreholes. Um, we've got some fun pictures up here on the right, um, down into the weathering crust. So we, we drilled uh, one to 1 1.5 meter boreholes. And as soon as they were emptied, they filled up with water um, and we were able to sample that water. So these are kind of the differences that we're comparing between the surface and the weathering crust. And that's kind of the basis of um, what I'm going to be walking through today is looking at the surface, which is pretty well studied. Um, there's a lot of light. There's a short amount of residence time because water is moving really quickly over the surface of the ice in things like streams. Um, but in the weathering crust, there's quite a much longer residence time. And there's also a much lower amount of light. So when you get about a meter into the ice surface, you only have about 10% of the light that's available on the surface. So these are the kind of the main questions. So I'm wondering, is this area distinct? Is it geochemically or microbiology wise distinct from the superglacial community, the surface communities? Um, the next thing is they're actually active biogeochemical cycling that's occurring. So kind of a theory that people have been working off of is that the weathering crust is storing nutrients um, and storing microbes, but are they actually doing something in that environment? And then last, are they serving, if there is active biogeochemical cycling, is it serving as a nutrient source for downstream ecosystems, which is kind of how I tie into the project. All right, so overall, we found that geochemically, the weathering crust seems pretty distinct from a nearby superglacial stream. So in general, there was quite a bit less oxygen in the weathering crust. Um, DIC was very similar, but then we saw major differences in dissolved organic carbon and in organic nitrogen. So um, it's nearly twice, or sorry, it's over twice as high, um, more DOC that's found in the weathering crust. And then organic nitrogen is much higher. Um, and then inorganic nitrogen is also about twice of what it is. Um, and this kind of makes sense if there's water that's getting stored in here, if there's active cycling going on. Um, but this is something that we really need to look into further. We also saw that from the FDOM that the organic matter that's there 
is much more protein-like than any other system we studied in the project um, along the Watson River. So there's definitely a lot of new production of organic matter that's happening in that environment. And then lastly, I'll just mention that the C to N ratios, there's a lot of variability in them. Um, so this is, this is our first year of results. So we'll soon have the results from this past summer. Um, lots of variability, but it could indicate that there is some nitrogen limitation going on here. And we have some experiments set up um, waiting on results for that will actually tell us what's going on there. So next we looked at the cell counts and biomass that were there. So again, it's this comparison between the very surface and slightly beneath in the weathering crust. So we found that there were much higher cell numbers in the weathering crust um, compared to the very surface and that they increased throughout the summer, but then there was a sharp decrease um, after July. So this kind of begs the question of like, are our cells just accumulating there? Are they getting deposited, getting stuck within the pores of the ice or is there active growth that's going on there? Um, we also looked at biomass. So we used chlorophyll um, to look at the phototrophic biomass and ATP to look at um, cellular biomass and found that although we saw some big differences in 2022, based off of this past year's results, that those are pretty comparable. So although the cell counts are different, um, the amount of biomass is similar. So these could be a bit less active than what is in the surface. Okay, so next I answer the question, is there active biogeochemical cycling? So I'm not gonna go super deep into the methods, um, but I used the um, NanoSims instrument to do this study. So I added 13C or um, 15N labeled substrates and I incubated them in situ on the ice sheet. And then I used the instrument. So it's basically like a mass spec coupled to a microscope. So you can look at individual cells and see the incorporation of, um, of the 13C or 15N, which could indicate that they are actively incorporating what you've added. So for to look at photosynthesis, I was adding sodium bicarbonate. Um, and then I also added amino acids to look at heterotrophic production. So when I added sodium bicarbonate, um, it was lower than expected, but um, still a decent number of cells were enriched in 13C in both the surface stream and in the weathering crust, um, about 20%. Um, and then you can also just see here on the left, um, the different enrichments that are, that are here. So when we're saying that cells are enriched, you can see what's lighting up here um, in the yellow is a large cell that um, is enriched in amino acids. Um, and then here on the right, we also saw for in regards to heterotrophic production that the majority of cells were active. Um, so I thought this was super interesting um, because like I said before, a lot of people kind of think that things could just be stored in the weathering crust, but this is, proof that there's actually some sort of active cycling that is going on um, because they are actively incorporating these substrates. Next, we looked at community composition. Um, and again, this is kind of like a first look. We haven't um, done a full analysis of our samples, but based off of 16S here on the left, so this is looking at the bacteria that are present, um, and then 18S is looking at eukaryotes. We found that there definitely are some significant differences between the surface stream and the weathering crust. Um, I don't think this is surprising based off of the other results I just showed where it looks like it's geochemically distinct and there's also active cycling going on. So it makes sense that they would form their own unique communities. Um, and this is something I'm hoping to explore further by looking at different functional genes that are present to see how they might be different in such a low light environment. And then I just wanted to show the eukaryotic genes um, to show that there's quite a bit of algae that are present. There's lots of algae and fungi that are present in these samples, um, as expected, although there are less of the um, kind of stereotypical ice algae or um, glacier algae that were found here. These are mostly algae that have been found um, in either they're ochrophytes, so they're potentially mixotrophic algae, um, 
So we're really interested to see what's going on there. Okay, so the last bit of data I'm gonna show is estimates of productivity. Um, so we were super excited to get back these results. So we had tried several different methods of measuring productivity um, and found this to be super difficult to measure with oxygen because the rates are so low. Um, and we finally were using 13C um, and looking at enrichments that were there. So we found that there's a significant amount of enrichment that's going on in the weathering crust and in the superglacial stream. So this is a measure in uh, micrograms of carbon per gram of carbon biomass per hour. Um, and we found that it was about 10 times higher in the superglacial stream compared to the weathering crust, which was interesting because that's nearly identical to the amount of light that's available. Um, so it seems to be directly related to light. Um, so these results are actually pretty comparable to what's been found in snow fields and in cryokinite holes um, and in the superglacial stream a bit more than that. Um, so this just indicates that there is cycling that's going on and that it could have significant contributions. Um, although this area hasn't really been considered, um, it could really be contributing a lot of new carbon um, to this environment. So just to sum up, um, we found that the weathering crust is microbiologically and geochemically distinct from the superglacial stream that we studied. We found that the majority of microbes that are present are actively involved in some sort of carbon or nitrogen cycling. And then we found that it, the weathering crust likely exports a good amount of organic carbon to downstream ecosystems, um, which could have really big impacts when looking at um, different proglacial systems because it's a pretty low productivity environment. So it's significant. It's a significant source of carbon to that environment. Um, so yeah, and now we're going to move on to something a bit different. I'm going to hand it off to you, Sung, and he's going to be talking about the deglaciated environments. Yeah, thanks, Casey. Okay, so uh, Andrea, can you give me a permission? Oh, okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, uh, so my name is Yusung Shin, and I'll present about the nutrient limitation in Greenland, st Greenland streams, focusing on deglaciated systems. Uh, going, before going on to this topic, I want to first introduce about the relationship between the producti stream productivity and nutrient limitation. So under nutrient limitation, uh, higher productivity is expected with higher nutrient supply. But if there's other limiting factors for streams, mostly light limitation, uh, the increase of nutrient supply does not lead to the increase of productivity. And when there's an addition of nutrient, under nutrient limitation, we expect higher productivity while we expect no response of productivity on when there is no nutrient limitation. But this response can vary uh, based on the different environmental conditions. Under dense canopy, which is the common condition in a temperate and tropical region, uh, the addition of nutrients does not lead to productivity increase because the light limitation is already constraining productivity there. When there's a less canopy cover, we expect higher productivity with nutrient addition, but this uh, response of productivity can be constrained by secondary nutrient limitation because which causes lower productivity response than expectation. In the Arctic ecosystem where we expect no light limitation because there's no canopy and high likelihood of secondary nutrient limitation, we also expect extremely low nutrient supply, uh, which cause a very low initial level of productivity. And because of that low level of productivity, uh, productivity response to nutrient addition can be uh, high, high as our expectation, even with secondary nutrient limitation. However, across the Greenland streams, this secondary nutrient limitation can show spatial heterogeneity because of different exposure ages. Uh, this, this is my five sites uh, for my nutrient experiment. Uh, we have three sites nearby uh, coastal systems and two sites in inland watershed. 
The three coastal watersheds, which are located nearby the town called Sisimut, uh, experience longer exposure from ice sheet after glacial retreat, which happens around like 10,000 years ago. And because of this long exposure age, it is likely that the geogenic nutrients here are uh, highly depleted. In contrast, in Lake Helen, where the exposure age is much shorter than uh, the coastal area, it is likely that the geogenic first nutrient is uh, relatively less depleted. And this special heterogeneity can cause the different level of secondary nutrient limitation, which again caused the different uh, productivity response level to nutrient addition. Based on these conditions, I uh, developed two hypotheses. The first is the nutrient limit. Okay, so the fourth hypothesis is that the nutrient limitation is prevalent in Greenland streams. And second one is that uh, the nutrient from weathering is more limiting coastal than inland watershed. Uh, to test this hypothesis, I conducted an experiment called nutrient diffusing substrate shortly NDS. The NDS is the cup uh, with agar solution inside and the British glass on top of that, as you can see in the photo. The agar solution supports microbial growth and the uh, Britic glass is used as a substrate for where biomass can accumulate. The benefit of this NDS is that you can amend nutrient inside of the agar solution. For this experiment, I amended three nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron. The photo shows the NDS set deployed in uh, underwater. Around after two weeks, there's a microbial growth up there and each NDF has different amount of biomass uh, accumulate, accumulated. Uh, after, that, after we detect the growth there, we, we retrieve them and compare the microbial growth between control and treatment to examine the effect of nutrients. For that, I first calculated the chlorophyll A on each NDF, which indicates the amount of autotrophic biomass and then calculated the response ratio, which is the ratio between chlorophyll A on treatment and chlorophyll A on control. If nutrient actually has effect on the microbial growth, then the chlorophyll A on treatment should be higher than the chlorophyll A on control, which means that under nutrient limitation, this response ratio should be higher than one. And I also used the method called two-way ANOVA following the description in the tank and the uh, 2003 to examine the co-limitation of multiple nutrients. Uh, I skipped the detail of the method, but the purpose of the method is to, is to separate the primary and secondary limiting nutrients, as you can see in my example box plot. Uh, as I shown before, I have five study sites to conduct this experiment, and I conducted this experiment twice uh, of the summer into 2022 to double check the nutrient limitation status of each site. So this box plot and the table shows the result. The box plot shows the response ratio of each NDS, and the table summarizes the type of nutrient limitation we found from each site in each season. Since these results contain lots of information, I'll, uh, I'll point out the main findings one by one on the following slides. And for visual conciseness, I removed the response ratio lower than one because I only focused on the nutrient limitation status, which is a response ratio higher than one. The fourth, about the prevalence of nutrient limitation. The red scare box plots are the NDS experiment with nitrogen treatment. And you can easily observe that this nitrogen limitation was prevalent across uh, Greenland, Greenland streams. And this prevalence of nitrogen limitation is due to extremely low nitrogen availability in Greenland streams. Uh, the line plot shows the temporary variation of nitrogen availability across Greenland, stre Greenland streams and the highest a uh, value you can find from there is around like 0.08 milligram per, mi milligram per liter, 
which is uh, around one or one order of magnitude lower than the availability we found in the U.S. river, uh, which is around one milligram per liter. So we can conclude that this low availability of nitrogen causes high importance of high importance of nitrogen on controlling a stream productivity. The second about the weather and nutrients. Here I pointed out the phosphorus uh, treatment, and here we found phosphorus limitation from LH6, the one site in inland watershed, and all three sites of coastal watershed. So just based on frequency, we can say that the phosphorus is more important in coastal than inland streams. And when we compare the role of phosphorus in each system, phosphorus was the secondary limiting nutrient in the inland watershed, while it is one of the primary limiting nutrients in the coastal systems. And when you see the box plot of the uh, phosphorus plus iron treatment, uh, phosphorus has impact even without the nitrogen there. And following this, iron shows much more distinctive difference between inland and coastal watershed. We were not able to observe any iron limitation in the inland streams while we found very strong iron limitation in a coastal system. And this iron act as a primary limiting nutrient there. This contrast between the inland and coastal watershed is due to the contrast in the iron availability. As you can see in this plot, uh, the inland watershed shows way higher iron availability than the coastal systems. And this, and in coastal system, because iron is more rare, uh, iron became one of the major nutrients that control productivity there. In conclusion, uh, first, I found the prevalence, prevalent nitrogen limitation across Greenland streams. And second, uh, I found that the weather nutrients are more limited at coastal watershed than inland watershed, and especially for iron. This research has implications on the Arctic systems because uh, the Arctic is experiencing the fastest warming in the globe, which, which is causing higher nutrient export from uh, permafrost melting. And based on, our, based on this research, we can expect higher productivity with that higher nutrient export. However, our study also suggests that this productivity response can vary, uh, vary with the distance from ice sheet because of difference in exposure age and also the consistency of nutrient level elevation because the pulse addition and the persist source of nutrient must have a different impact on stream ecosystem. So this was my study, and the next speaker, Bernanda, will talk about the circulation in period system. Um, do I have control now? Yes. Hey, hi, so I'm Fernanda, and I'm going to talk about the exchange flows. And the Kangerlussuk Fjord. So the Kangerlussuk Fjord is a very long, around 170 kilometers long um, fjord. Uh, which is fed by the by the rivers, uh, which are loaded with fresh water from the streams and the ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet. Uh, so the um, the Kanger Kanger Lusuak Fjord is mostly fed by the Watson River, and also there's the the second um, river called the Uvi Mit River. Um, and the way I want to approach the the physical setup of the circulation is that this fjord um, is considered a fjord, a strain-like fjord, which means that it has, as mentioned, um, freshwater input from one side, which comes from the Greenland ice sheet, and on the other side, at the mouth, it has uh, ocean water that's coming in and out with the tides. So usually the circulation in, a, in an environment like this will be driven either by the tides or the freshwater input. And it's also modulated by Coriolis and frictional effects, as well as systems. We usually average them over a tidal cycle. Um, 
And when we average the, the instantaneous velocities over a tidal cycle, uh, over one tidal cycle in, in a system like this, we will usually get fresh water coming in the surface and then uh, denser water coming from the ocean underneath it. Um, so what we did is went out to a cross section really close to the head of the fjord and took uh, instantaneous velocities with an ADCP uh, through a semi-diurnal tidal cycle. So we went back and forth in the same line uh, for around 12 hours. And we set three different stations in the two edges and in the center of the channel to to take uh, CTD profiles to get the hydrography of the entire water column or as far as the instrument let us. Um, and what we found out, it's a uh, very... Um, specific case. So instead of finding the so-called estuarine circulation, which comes with fresh water at the surface and um, denser water coming in at the bottom over a tidal cycle, we found what we see in this plot. Um, so I'm showing you the exchange flow that's also called residual circulation. So we have the depth of the fjord in the y-axis, uh, the cross section of, of the width that we chose in the x-axis. And then the color plots show the along velocities, uh, along field velocities, which means that the red colors are coming out of the screen. It's like the water was coming out of the screen. And blue colors is um, water coming into the screen. So we got this like three layer asymmetric circulation with outflow in the surface in the upper um, northern side of the fjord. Then we have an inflow layer uh, asymmetric that is stronger in the southern side of the fjord and then like a compensation uh, outflow layer that comes outside um, out of the of the screen coming outside of the fjord um, and then the arrow shows the transverse structure of the flow which kind of looks like in the in the upper layer as it's deflected to both to the right and to the left so if we think about it like the inflow is coming into the screen and then it's deflected to the right we can attribute this to the the effect of Coriolis's forces. And then when the water is coming out of the screen, it also reflects to the right, uh, which again can be attributed to the to Coriolis effects, rotational effects. Um, but we we don't know with this circulation, it doesn't let us know if it's uh, driven by the tides or freshwater uh, input from the Greenland ice sheet. So what we did is went one step backwards and what I'm showing you now is the instantaneous velocities at each uh, time that we cross the, the cross section of the fjord. Uh, in this case, the blue blue colors, the blue shades are showing us outflow velocities. So they're coming outside of the screen. And then the red ones is inflow coming uh, from the ocean mostly. So we can like the, um, the green uh, rectangles around them is showing the flood tide then the uh, purple ones is the slack tide and then at the end we have the the ebb tide um, in red uh, rectangles so what we can see is that we have this fresh water input that is constant all through the the tidal cycle which usually is damped by the tide so so this kind of tells that the coastal water input is very important and it's giving us this like surface uh outflow layer that is not as usual in in usual strain circulation, but how it increases and changes over the tidal cycle kind of tells that it's modulated by the tide. So both drivers are important, the freshwater input as, as well as the tides. And as a take home message, we can see like what I'm showing here is the freshwater input is very important. This is a picture from the Watson River discharge. Then Coriolis forces are deflecting the flow towards the right side of the flow. And we have a like small modulation of the tides. Um, and why is this like so important, right? Um, so when we look at the backscatter, because we're using an ac acoustic Doppler instrument, this matches with this the two big layers with outflow in, in the right in the left hand hand side and then inflow in the in the right hand side. And this aligns with the hydrography that we found which tells how like the can give us information on how the sediments are um, distributed or concentrated along the across the, the section of the fjord. So 
So when we look at the picture of the satellite picture on the bottom right, we can see this like freshwater plume or this plume without sediments that matches this purple side on the back scatter. So this can give us a little hint on how the different nutrients sediments are distributed in the in the fjord. And it's also kind of important to take this into account when we try to measure either the distribution or the export of nutrients and sediments from along the fjord, as well as the exchange uh, budget from heat or salt between the, the Greenland ice sheet and the outer ocean through the fjord. Um, and that will be my part. All right, so I was just uh, gonna kind of summarize the take home messages from these three talks. Um, the first being that the weathering crust aquifer is a really unique environment that's critical to understanding carbon cycling in the Arctic. Um, Yusung showed us that in Arctic streams, nutrient limitation is prevalent, but with varying types across the gradient of exposure ages. And finally, uh, fjords exhibited a three layer circulation influenced by freshwater input rotational effects and modulated by the tides. Um, and it's important to take into account the variability of transverse structure of the flow in the process of determining total outputs from the fjord. Um, before we go into questions, I wanted to sort of show the, the breadth of the team that's actually working on this project. So we saw um, three talks, but we have a number of other students and postdocs in the team um, working on topics including remote sensing, uh, moss ecology, microbial ecology, watershed hydrology, and journalism and science communication. Um, so this is a, a, a piece of the project um, that, that involves this kind of interdisciplinary look at how this landscape evolution has impacted um, physical and chemical processes. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, NSF, uh, the University of Florida Water Institute, um, as well as the amazing field support that was provided by the Kangaroo-Spock Inter International Science Support and Polar Field Services. Um, and with that, I think we are ready to take questions. I will be, um, what's the word, moderating. <laughs> You can just unmute or write questions in the chat. Hi, um, I have a question more coming from the glaciological side, um, where I'm wondering is, can we actually also learn vice versa by how, for example, um, uh, like from where the, or like can we learn something about where the nutrients are coming from, from the ice sheet, um, by seeing like how, um, how are they, yeah concentrated in the water and learn something about, for example, runoff patterns on the ice sheet or like where the water is coming from, if it's stored somewhere on the way to the to the coast. Um, yeah. Or is, is this um, too, too, yeah, unclear. I can take a stab at that unless, does anyone else wanna? Well, so, Part of the project that we didn't really talk about today was that uh, we also have data sets from, um, we have a, a time series of, of um, subglacial discharge coming from underneath the ice sheet, so the headwaters of the Watson River. Um, and this includes both subglacial discharge as well as superglacial discharge that has been delivered through the to, to the sub uh, to the subglacial environment through things like moulins. Um, and so I'm not sure if this directly answers your question, but we do observe large variations in the composition of that water throughout the melt season, suggesting um, variations in whether the, the water is coming from mainly a superglacial source versus a subglacial source. So I think there's definitely a way to 
um, use the chemistry of the of the proglacial river to try to understand something about the the discharge dynamics um, in terms of where the water is coming from. Um, so yeah, that is that's absolutely a really interesting question and something that I think um, we could we we could work on with our data set, um, but we don't have that quite uh, worked up yet. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, and also thank you for three really nice or like four really nice talks. Thanks. Really liked it. So we have a chat question to Fernanda. How much do you think your results might vary seasonally in different weather conditions? And will it matter in your big picture conclusions? Yeah, they will definitely do. Um, we know, at least in Gangerluso Fjord, that the inner part gets frozen, about like a one meter of sea ice, um, which uh, damps the, the fresh water output. So if we don't have this fresh water input constantly, we will have a different setup that will look more like a set down in the head of the fjord. So we will probably won't have the compensatory flow underneath outflow, um, which will lead probably to uh, either two layers circulation or just like one layer circulation uh, without stratification, um, depending on how frozen it gets during the season. the season, different time steps. But yeah, it will have um, it will have consequences. Uh, sorry, I just read the second part, not suggesting to go back and do it on, in the storm. Uh, maybe rainwater won't change it that much because the fresh water input from the Watson is way more important. But yeah, it will definitely have different um, conclusions and when we measure like sediments and stuff or nutrients that will probably also be distributed differently because the picnic line will go all the way down to the deep water of the fjord um but consequently we will have sediment discharge during um ice season i hope i Great. Any more questions? Yeah, the next one also is for me. So... Oh, sorry, I didn't see that one. Your cross section was near the head of the fjord. Do you have any observations how that evolves down fjord? I did a on my own uh, fjord uh, hydrographic uh, sampling on the first year. And because of the bathymetry, we have very uh, strong tidal currents at the mouth of the fjord, which I don't exactly understand how does the circulation pattern changes. We just know that it doesn't let sea ice formation during winter. And it also stratifies, well, yeah, instead of finding a vertical stratification, we'll probably find a, like a horizontal stratification of the flow driven by tides. But I do not have data from Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for tuning in. And um, I think, is that it? Can or should we wait for more questions? Falk? Um, yeah, I guess if not more questions are coming, uh, I think we uh, can, yeah, we can close other, yeah, well, last, last chance if anybody has last chance. questions. Yeah, thanks very much for your attention. Okay, yeah, All but right. definitely really, really nice talks today. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you a lot for, for presenting. You have a... Uh... Uh, PR slide for the next week's seminar. Um, I don't have one, so. If you do. I, uh, Andrea, can I ask you to send us uh, the cover slide because I put this on YouTube. Sure. Uh, yes, sure.
Yep, absolutely. And, uh, I usually have the picture that, uh, that people click on if they want to listen to it. But I do send out the link to everybody on Cryolist, Facebook and Twitter. So that would be very good if you could send me. It looks a lot nicer to have that and do it that way. And apologies, my camera is not uh, working. So you'll just have to do with my penguin. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. I'll send you that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, then um, I, yeah, I'm going to close the seminar. But again, thank you, everybody, for presenting and for listening. And uh, yeah, I, uh, next week's talks, I can quickly uh, see what they are. Um, so it's a talk by um, by Liz Marie Andreasen about highlights from the International Association of Cryosphere Sciences. And uh, yeah, would be happy to see you there again. And uh, goodbye. See you then. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. And well done. Thank you.